For those of you who are with us for the first time, first time in a while, we're in a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit are things that God develops in us. It's our character coming to reflect more more accurately, more beautifully the character of Christ in us. All this in the power of the Holy Spirit. That the Bible teaches that when, when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, there's certain things that start showing up in your life as you lean into that relationship. And they start showing up in ever-increasing ways as you lean into the relationship, as you partner with the Holy Spirit in this process. And the fruit of the Spirit, one of the things about it is it's also evidence that you belong to the Lord. Because... These things don't just show up in everybody. Uh, oh, you can get a little illustration of it, a little glimpse here and there from someone who's not a Christ follower, but, but these things, they're the evidence. The evidence that you belong to Jesus is not that you're a member of a church, not that you were baptized, not that you were confirmed, uh, not that you try hard to be a good person. The evidence that you belong to Christ is fruitfulness. And part of that is the spiritual fruit, and part of that is the, the, the fruit of the harvest of sharing the gospel but evidence, you don't have to guess. There are things that, that are going to be true in the life of a person who belongs to Jesus. So you start asking, with the fruit of the Spirit, and we started this way, there are nine of these, and we're on the next to the last one. We're talking about gentleness today. You say, here's my life, and here's the fruit of the Spirit, these nine things. And how are those things lining up? Are they, is, is it coming out pretty close at this point in my spiritual journey, or do I see, here's my life, and here's the fruit of the Spirit, and well, there is not a good alignment there, and there's some several things I need to work on. Some of them, you say, I'm pretty good with that one, not so good with that one, but you can't be satisfied to cherry pick, uh, this one's easy for me, this one's hard for me, I'll leave the hard behind. But all of these things should come to characterize your character in Christ. You can't do it by willpower, you can't do it by trying to be more, a more moral person. These things happen because the Holy Spirit works in you, and you join in that work. Here's what Paul says about the Holy Spirit working in us to produce fruit. Galatians 5, and we've read this uh, every Sunday of the series. The fruit of the Spirit, here's the, he just gives the list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so you look at those nine things. Here they are, and here's me. And how, how am I doing? Am, am, I, am I making the progress I should be making at this point in my spiritual journey? And what we've done with the series, it's just a list here. There's no explanation. There's no amplification on what this means and what it looks like in our lives. And so what we're going to do today again is we're going to take other passages of Scripture to expound on what, is, what exactly does this fruit look like? Today we're talking about gentleness. And, you know, some of these, oh, man, Love, I, I, I want to work on the love. peace, I, I need that. Gentleness, no, I'll pass. Because it, it just it doesn't sound that attractive to us. Doesn't, oh man, I, give me some gentleness, man. I want more of that. Because it's counter to our culture. We live in a culture, right, where screaming at one another is our primary way of uh, communicating. Uh, complaining, voicing our opinions. Declaring what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with everybody else. And then comes gentleness. Maybe we need this one more than we need uh, any of the rest. So in one of the most familiar places in the Bible, there's a word that pops up. It pops up in my English Standard Version as, as uh, meek. It shows up in my New American Standard as gentle. And you find that... Uh, it's the same word, and it shows up all through the Bible. We're talking about gentleness, meekness today. And that's the way you hear it most of the time, because it shows up in the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 5. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The New American Standard, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Of all the things in the world God has chosen us to be, gentleness, meekness, uh, what do, you think, what do you think of when those things come to mind? Well, you think uh, maybe wimp, spineless, coward, jellyfish, indecisive. Someone who's going to bow before every breeze. Someone more of a doormat and uh, 
hard driving world. And, and God says, blessed are the meek. Well, for us in our culture, because the nature of a lot of these words, what, how do we see them? Gentleness, meekness, we think meekness more is weakness than is strength. And yet it's a great spiritual value. We see it declared in Christ. Christ declares it for us as this is what it, remember the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, it's just a whole story about this is what a disciple looks like. This is what one of my followers looks like and how they live and how they live differently than the rest of the world. And when we get to the fruit of the Spirit, the same word shows up again. This time as gentleness, Paul says, this is what characterizes the life of a believer. And that's why we focus in on this word today. Now, uh, to go to the great theologian Charlie Brown, the comic strip. Well, Charlie Brown in three panels, this was the story. Uh, <laughs> that, and Charlie Brown's really, when you think about meekness, gentleness, you think Charlie Brown. Uh, somebody's just getting run, run over by the world on a regular basis. And here's Charlie Brown. He's giving a report in school, which is his favorite thing always, to have to uh, declare things in front of his teacher and his peers. And he says, my subject today is glaciers. Glaciers are huge rivers of ice. A glacier will frequently move forward one foot while retreating three feet. Last panel, which reminds me a lot of myself. Meekness, gentleness. Uh, it does conjure up the idea, the poor guy walking down the hallway at school and everyone's laughing and everyone's pointing. And he's oblivious and doesn't understand why and only to discover he has a sign taped to his back that says, kick me. It's that guy that we think of and we think about gentleness, meekness, somebody that's going to get run over, never does anything, never gets in trouble because never does anything good or bad. The person who's never more than a follower because they never have an opinion, they're always destined to come in last, always to be taken advantage of. And we say, it's not what I want for my children, certainly not what I want for myself to be that kind of person. You need to state your opinions. You need to make yourself known. You need to push yourself to the front. I looked up synonyms for meek and words like uh, thesaurus. Weak, cowed, uh, co uh, compliant. In Roger's thesaurus, the last word, we're talking about synonyms for meekness, for gentleness, is spiritless. Spiritless. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the spiritless. For they shall inherit the earth. One guy said... If the meek, the gentle, inherit the earth, it's going to be fascinating to watch to see how long they can hang on to it. Somebody's going to take it away from them. That's the nature of who they are. Well, the world's beatitudes are a little different than Jesus' beatitudes, and the concept of meekness in the Bible is a lot different than what we think of in this category. In, in Greek culture, there are certain words that were categorized by Greek philosophers as the great ethical words. And they would write about them and talk about them and discuss them and debate them. The big things, the important things. And this was one of their great ethical words. It has several different connotations. One of those philosophers described this word for gentleness, meekness, and I'll use those interchangeably all morning. Described it as the middle ground between excessive anger and excessive angerlessness. It's finding balance in life. One Bible scholar said, Blessed is the man who is always angry at the right time, never angry at the wrong time. It also has a sense of humility about it. So the meek man, the meek woman, is one who possesses humility. Humility. The kind of person who sees himself before God as they should see themselves before God. God is God and I'm not, which is what's going to keep a lot of people out of heaven. Is they, they always see themselves as they're in charge and God is serving as their consultant available for needs as they express them to God. Instead of, I'm under his authority, he's in charge, I am not, he is God, I am not. Humility. The best place to begin, I think, in this discussion Psalm 37. Because Psalm 37, see Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus quoted the Old Testament, Psalm 37, when he said that, it appears. 
And so let's go back to Psalm 37 because there's a little bit of amplification on this story there. We'll look at Psalm 37. We're going to see, and we'll read several uh, verses from here. We'll learn a lot more about what gentleness, meekness looks like, how we can define it more effectively. So here's, uh, here's what it says in Psalm 37:11, where it appears Jesus was quoting at least a part of what he shared in the Sermon on the Mount. The bl- blessed... Well, let's see. There we go. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. Psalm 37, 11. So we're going to see what meekness means, what it has to do with God. Now, here we go. Psalm 37, verses 9 through 11. Uh, and I'll do this from the New American Standard Version, just like Paul and Peter would have. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. A little of what you see here is in verse 11 and verse 9, there's some things that start connecting. Because what we have in verse 11 and verse 9, the humble, the meek, will inherit the land, and those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. They're 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 ending up in the same place, so they have that characteristic in common, So we conclude, meek people are people who wait for the Lord. You see how interpreting the Bible works out? You look at the context and you see, same same in game, inherit. So, these are meek people, they wait for the Lord. Now what does it mean to wait for the Lord? And here's here's how that breaks out. Verses 5 through 8 gives uh, good evidence of that. Those who wait for the Lord, those who are meek, who are gentle... Commit your way to the Lord, the psalmist says. Trust also in Him and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. What are these people like? who, uh, according to verse 11, are the the meek. Verse 9, who wait patiently for the Lord. Verse 5 says they commit their way to the Lord and trust the Lord. Verse 7 says they're quiet, are still before the Lord. They don't fret over what's going on with other people, even evil people. And verse 8 says they cease from anger and forsake wrath. So, we're going to put this together in a portrait of what what does meek, what does gentle look like in my life, in your life, practical application. Here's the first thing. And I think we got an outline in your bulletin even because we're so generous. Here's the first thing. They trust God. Simple enough. The people who are gentle, they trust God. And the only way you're going to be gentle, you're not always trying to get it done yourself. You're going to trust God. Meek people begin there. Verse 5, last part of verse 5. They believe He will work for them, that He will vindicate them. When others oppose them, Biblical meekness is rooted in a confidence. God is for you. He is not against you. A lot of people wrestle with that one. Is he really for me? And can he deal with whatever's going on in my life? What does the Bible say? If God is for me, who can be against me? Do you really believe that's true? Okay, well, we'll we'll vote on something else later. Um, Do you really believe it's true? If God is for me, who can be against me? Do you believe that's true? Okay, we're up to 50% now. I won't do it another time because it hurts my feelings too badly. (laughs) A deep confidence. You start out with a deep confidence. If you're going to have that gentleness and humility, first of all, God's God and I'm not. And he's in charge. And I can trust him to be in charge of my life and my way. Uh, And that brings us to the second thing. People who are the meek, people who are gentle, they commit their way to God. And <laughs> this is the first part of verse 5. The Hebrew word for commit is used in other contexts. It means to roll. So you, you, you roll things onto God. So here's me and here's you. And we have uh, challenges with business and problems in life and relationships and health and fears and frustrations. And here's the... To be the gentle, to be the meek, you just you roll all that that you, that you came in here carrying, you roll it all onto God and you say, I trust God. And because of that, 
I'm going to admit I can't deal with the complexities and the pressures and the obstacles of this life, so I'm going to trust God that he's able to, and I'm actually going to give it to him instead of trying to continue to carry it myself and pretend like God's in charge. I'm going to roll this all onto God, believing he will sustain me, he will protect me, he will guide me, he will bless me. Third thing, the meek, the, the gentle are quiet before God and wait for him. This out of verse 7. The gentle people are quiet or still before the Lord. They wait patiently for him. And when we think about this, well, there, there you go again. It's, it's the guy who's just sitting on his hands, just waiting for somebody else to bail him out. And meanwhile, he continues to get uh, just run over by everybody and everything in life. Maybe just too lazy to take responsibility for his own life. We put a lot of, we put a lot of picture, a lot of definition that's bad on on this thing of gentle. But here's what it really means, to be free of frenzy. Now, we are a frenzied people. We fill our lives with activity, and then more activity, and more activity, and we feel guilty if every moment of every day isn't taken up with something. And not only do we do this to ourselves, then we take it, and and we suck our children into it, and we fill their lives so full of stuff that They can't ever hear God or know God or follow God because there's no space to do it. Because we are frenzied. Oh my. This is the plague of our day. And we, many of you have been through our our training now. We had a great day of training yesterday where we've talked about sharing the gospel, the three circles. And we talk about the circle that this is the broken world and everybody's trying to escape the broken world. They're trying to get free. They feel the brokenness. They feel it in themselves. They see it in the world and they want to escape it. One of the biggest things, and we talk about, oh, some people try religion. Some people try education. Some people are going to medicate their pain in an unhealthy way. Some people, and so everybody who shares that presentation has a different point of application for how people are trying to escape brokenness. But one of the big ways we do it here in North Texas is we just fill up the calendar. And we run fast like a dog chasing its tail. And we create this frenzied activity around our lives so that we're so busy we don't have time to stop and reflect. My heart's kind of dark. And my life's pretty broken. And maybe, maybe I need to back up and look a little more to God in my life and let my kids do it too instead of keeping them from God by all the activity I've sucked them into. This is to know God is omnipotent, that my affairs of my life, my, the, the direction of my life is under his control. And he's really is gracious to work things out. Meek people, gentle people, have a quiet steadiness about them in the middle of a world that is filled with mayhem. Here's the fourth thing. They don't fret over the wicked. Have you done any fretting over the wicked recently? Well, you watch the news and you see a lot of wicked and you fret over it. You fret over it for your sake, for your for your kids' sake, grandchildren's sake. But here's, here's uh, where it comes out so much in, uh, in the Psalms, and I'm reading through the Psalms right now. I had read through the first dozen or so Psalms this morning in my quiet time, and, and I was amazed at how many times I circled the same phrase in those first dozen. How long, O Lord? That's what he keeps asking. How long? One of them, he does four of them in a row. How long? Are evil people going to be getting away with it? How long? Are people who are mean going to be getting the best of me? How long? And he goes through this list of just crying out, wicked people are, how come they get, things work out pretty good for bad people. I'm trying to live for you, God. Seems like I'm just on the receiving end of a beating every day. Why is that so? fretting over the wicked. And what it says in verse 8 is that the gentle refrain from anger because their family, their work, their life are in God's sovereign hands and they trust Him and they wait patiently and quietly to see how His power and goodness is going to work things out. And when they have setbacks and when people oppress them, when opponents attack them, it doesn't refer to His bitterness or anger or fretfulness, that's, that's the way people who don't know God act. But instead, there's a gentleness. And that gentleness, you know where it comes from? Not from anything that's natural for me ever, uh, or you ever. It comes from God. 
and recognizing our position in relationship to God, that he's God, I'm not, and I can trust him with everything. Now, gentleness, meekness, I'm going to shift gears. Probably, if you have been to church and ever heard a sermon about Matthew 5, 5, somebody, somewhere, a Sunday school lesson, a uh, Bible study you've been a part of, men's group, women's group, anywhere, you've heard the illustration that this word, meek or gentle, from Matthew 5, 5, and it's the same root word that we're going to deal with in the fruit of the Spirit, multiple other places, was also used in reference to domesticated animals. You heard this before? That a horse that had been trained that would be under the authority, the control of a rider was considered a gentle, a meek horse. Doesn't mean there wasn't a whole lot of horsepower going on. It just means they were under the control of another. I remember uh, we were doing horse stuff with my daughter, Lauren. She was a little bitty thing. She sat on the back of big horses. And with that, with that bit and that bridle, that horse would just turn wherever she wanted it to. Uh, a power under control of a, even a little girl. And to be meek, to be gentle, is to is power under control. So the meek person has learned to accept control. Not weakness, meekness, gentleness. The ability to accept control. And if, this is what our Lord had in mind. Blessed are the meek. Those who have learned to accept control. And not from controlling people. But the control of God. The authority of God in your life. The authority of God is what we pull against. What we... With our, with our bit and our bridle, we're pulling against God's authority over our lives. But when, when you lean into that, that's when the meek inherit the earth. Now, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that meekness is submissiveness to God's control. The meek will guide in judgment, and the meek, he will teach his way. Psalm 25, uh, 9, a lot of meekness is being teachable. And for those of us, as we get older, you've been, a lot of you, you've been going to church a long time. You have heard plenty of sermons, plenty of Bible studies, and you're listening to three podcasts and two sermons on the radio and all that every week. So you're, you're all full up with Bible knowledge, but you haven't done anything with it in years. You're just accumulating more knowledge, but there's no obedience. There's no gospel taking place flowing out of that. It's just the knowledge. And there is a difference between knowing stuff and doing something with what you know. And that's our challenge in this. Are you teachable? Are you learning new things? Have you taken a next step with God? I've been at this in a fairly intentional way for a long time. But, but this week, God was working on me in a couple of new areas where I hadn't, I hadn't turned over that rock in a while. And you have to continue to be teachable. A lot of people have, I have, I have life all figured out because I'm... 16 years old, right? I have life all figured out because I'm 30 years old, because I'm 50 years old. A lot of people, they, they, now this is how the world works and I work within the world and everything is done from here. I'm going forward with what I got. Oh, there's always a place to grow and being meek and gentle is saying, God, there's probably something I can learn today and I pray that you would show me what it is and that I would be obedient to what you have to say. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, now, I, Paul, myself urge you, and so he's, he's going to push them, and he says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, because again, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's the character of God, it's the life of Jesus being lived out in this world. It's a characteristic of Jesus preeminently. He was a meek man, a gentle man, because he was a man who said, not my will, but yours be done. It, he's a man under authority. Now, if anyone ever had reason to not accept control and authority of another, it ought to be Jesus, second person of the Trinity. He is King of kings, Lord of lords, the Bible says. But I have one of those pages in my Bible that is so stained by thumb prints over years. And there are a lot of those pages in the book of Philippians. And here's what it says about Jesus. Paul said, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, 
being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus has a humility, a meekness, a gentleness. uh, But he thundered against the false teaching of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He called them out in big, bold ways. He wasn't, oh, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's a tough world out there. I guess they just get away with it. No, he took them on. He, he went right at them in front of everybody. Uh, you see, Jesus, he's the one who goes to the temple, and they, they've created so many barriers, people can't even worship God in the temple. And he, he said, you can't be using this as a pass-through shortcut from one side of town to the other. And he turns over tables of the money changers because they've turned, they've turned what should be a house of prayer into a marketplace. But see the same Jesus, he'll call out the hypocrisy. He'll, he thunders and the next minute he's weeping with compassion over the lostness of Jerusalem, over the brokenness of the world. People that are like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, you see... The confrontational nature of gentleness and the humility and the compassion of gentleness in Christ. There are great illustrations of this, thing, this in the Bible. And I want to give you some illustrations of this. First one's uh, good old Moses. Numbers 12 says, Now the man Moses was very meek, gentle, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Now some of you, you say, I don't think that's what it's supposed to say. Because I have heard another translation that said Moses is more humble than any man who's ever on the face of the earth. Because uh, that word ends up being translated all those ways through the Hebrew language. Humility, gentleness, meekness, all start reflecting. So here's here's Moses. He's the most humble guy in the world. So meek and mild in so many ways. He was interested in he knows all the, all the benefits of living in the household of Pharaoh. He's in the upper, upper reaches of the power structure of the strongest nation on the earth at the time. And yet he's willing to let all that go in order to do what God wanted him to do and to care about his people. And it's that compassionate gentleness in his character. And this compassionate, gentle, uh, submissive to God kind of guy, he takes on the most powerful man in the world. He delivers the people uh, from uh, slavery in Egypt, Red Sea parts, and all. The, and you remember what happens a little while later? His brother and sister of all people, the people closest to him, they say, well, why is Moses always in the headlines? Why is Moses such a big deal? We ought to be getting a little headline ourselves. We're pretty special people. But instead of just jumping in the middle of them, instead of uh, calling down a plague on them, he just... Trusted the justice of God to make rights wrong, uh, wrongs right, and to to bring justice where there was injustice. And he he sees God being God. There's a guy named Abraham, father of the Jewish people. Uh, Talk to God face to face. He is uh, he's a man to whom God promised the, this covenant relationship between him, his Abraham's descendants, and himself. And here's Abraham. He's promised blessing and prosperity and all these gifts from God. He's a powerful man. But he has this nephew named Lot. And they both have owned a lot of stuff and things are getting sort of crowded. Hard to find places to pasture all these flocks that they each have. And so Abraham says, Lot, we're going to have to divide up. We can't all stay here together. It's too many conflicts popping up. I tell you what, here's all the land. You pick whatever you want. And Lot says, he looks and he sees the well-watered Jordan Valley and plus two resort towns. Sodom and Gomorrah are a part of this. Strong economic base for his uh, operation. So he says, okay, I think that uh, I'll take that. And Abraham takes the hill country Harder living, harder to make a living, but he takes the hill country because he's a, he's a gentle spirit. Then you have Lot, and he gets in trouble, ends up being taken captive and hauled off by these enemy kings. And who comes for him? Meek and mild Abraham? No, it's Abraham at the head of his own army, and he just beats the tar out of the guys who did that to, to Lot. 
and picks him up and brings him home because he's the most humble, gracious, gentle, powerful man in the land. Think about King David. He was a, he was a gentle, meek kind of character in the Bible, especially in relationship to crazy King Saul. Think about King Saul. Saul is, he's just a jerk to David at every turn, and David does nothing but good to him. But David just keeps on doing good to him. And even though David's been anointed to be the next king of Israel, and he knows it's his right, and he could have just taken it, he keeps serving Saul. He keeps serving the people of God because he says, you know, God set Saul up as king, and until God removes him from that, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and trying to do the best I can with it. Because he was a gentle, compassionate kind of spirit. If he was going to get an award at that stage of his life, that stage of his journey with God, he was going to do it in a best supporting actor role. Jeremiah. Here's Jeremiah. He's a fiery prophet. I'm reading Jeremiah too right now. And Jeremiah, he's a boiling cauldron of fire. And he spits fire on everybody. But when, when everything... And then they, people treated him terribly. You know, they abused him... Uh, he took a beating from his folks, and they never did what he told them to do. But when he got a door of opportunity to really live the good life, to, to break free of these knuckleheads he'd been trying to work with all these years, instead, he just digs in and he says, no, God called me to these people, and I'm going to stay with them, even, even though they're hard people. And they kept on being hard people, but he was faithful. He was a, he was a fiery prophet with a gentle heart. He just really loved those folks. In spite of their sinful choices. He didn't give up on them. There was Paul. Paul's a powerful personality. We find him being proud, selfish, brutal, arrogant. And then he met Christ. And he's still a pretty fiery guy. And he'll jump in the middle of everybody and everything. Strong opinions. But we find him, we find him under authority now. Not just doing whatever he wants, saying whatever he wants. But he's under the authority of God. And he's going to care about people. And he's going to move the ball down the field for God's glory and kingdom of God things. Meek, humble, gentle. I want to give you a personal example. Uh, somebody, probably none of you know or ever will know. His name is Jack Crabb. Jack, when, when Rhonda, Rhonda and I got married December uh, 85, we got married and Rhonda graduated in December 85, and from Hardin Simmons, where the dew falls first from heaven, and she came and joined me in Fort Worth, where I was in seminary, and I was working a warehouse job and waiting for her to get to where I was, and we're so glad to finally be in the same place at the same time after living uh, four hours apart for a good while, and we joined a church that had a bride and groom Sunday school class. So we were in there with a bunch of other newlyweds. It really helped to build a lot of good foundation for us. And we did that for the first six months we were married. And then God opened a door for us to go and serve in a church in uh, Grand Prairie. And so we spent the next uh, couple of years in that church. And in that church, we met Jack Crabb. Jack and his wife, Carolyn. Well, Jack, he was about 6'5", really, really smart, and really, really successful in everything that he did. And uh, at this church, he was the chairman of deacons. He was the director of Sunday school. He was the outreach director. He was right in the middle of every decision that church made. And overwhelmingly, uh, just, I mean, conservatively, I would say, he gave maybe 50 to as much as 60% of the total giving of the church. Uh, Rhonda and I, we'd drive over to uh, Grand Prairie from Fort Worth on Saturday, a little after lunch, and we stayed with Jack and Carolyn every Saturday night and then all day Sunday, and they fed us every meal that we ate while we were there, and we, we did some things on Saturday with young adults, with kids, with teenagers, and we do things on, on Sunday, then of course all day long, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, drive back late Sunday night. Um... Jack, if he was in the... So, with all that power. And this is a small church. Jack would have been a leader at any church in the world. Uh, any size. He was that guy. He, he was funny. He, he told me a story once that he said, I got called for jury duty again. 
I said, did you? Did you get picked? And he said, oh yeah, I'm the chairman of the... He had been the, he had been, he had been the head guy. Of, he'd served like on 10 juries in the course of his life. I mean, he's an older guy by the time we met him. He'd always been the foreman of the jury. Every time. He was always there. Everyone else saw it in him too. But in that little church where he exercised so much, could have exercised so much power, if he was in the minority view, he just, if it wasn't something that was really kingdom-centered, him, okay. He, he, he let other folks have, have their way. He never put his opinion out first, but eventually they usually had enough sense to ask him, Jack, what do you think? And when he started talking, everything got really quiet. And you knew, this is going to go well. Because Jack's speaking into it now. He was my favorite example, personally, of that, that gentle, humble, meek spirit. And he led with great strength of character. And strength of, of servanthood. That's how he did stuff. And I think that's what it's supposed to look like in us. Now, I, gave, I want to give you some personal examples. I want to give you just a quick set, five things. These are five words that just help to paint a picture of what this looks like. Uh, we've, talked, we've touched on some of this. First, someone who is, has the spiritual fruit of gentleness. Well, gentle is the opposite of being loud boisterous, inconsiderate, and insensitive. It's a way to deal kindly and sensitively with even the most difficult of people in your life. Tame and uh, bridled power. Uh, that's gentleness. In, uh, in Greek culture, it's interesting. You know, we have sayings in our culture, idioms. Uh, they did too. You, you may have heard the, the one, uh, meek as a mouse. That's meekness associated with a mouse. The Greeks didn't say that, but they had a saying about, they said, meek as a lion. That was how they painted power under control. Teachable. You can't be meek if you're not teachable. You have to surrender to God's, God's authority. Let go and let God. Fourth thing, not self-conscious. That means uh, that you can't worry about what everyone else says about you. Really, you're, you're trying to serve an audience of one. You want to please him with, with everything you do and everything you are. And there, there's a humility and a gentleness that comes that when attacks come, when people say things about you that aren't right. When uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. When people look at you and you go, they say, yeah, you are kind of poor in spirit. It doesn't just crush you. You're, you're okay with that because ultimately you're answering to God, not to, not to what the critics say. And then patient. It just means in this high-strung, neurotic, impatient age that has led so much to, to broken homes and to ulcers and to heart attacks, to be, to be different than that, to be countercultural, to be meek. Uh, as you have come to know about me over these years together, I, have, I appreciate great poetry. And so I, I have this about marriage from a great poet describing the marriage. It says, theirs was a beef stew marriage. And their case is somewhat crude. The wife was always beefing and the husband always stewed. And in that kind of world, Jesus says, blessed are the gentle, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ultimately, this is about meekness before God. And, and I want you to remember something about where this comes from. Because remember, Jesus is blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit. Now think about that. If you inherit something, did you have to work for it? Did you earn it? Or was it just given to you? And this inheritance that is ours is really a gift from God. And that's what grace is. It's a gift from God. Giving us not only what, not giving us what we do deserve, but giving us things that we do not deserve. And we come to see everything as a gift of grace to inherit. The meek, the gentle, are those who have been made deserving. Not by what they've done, but by the saving work of Christ. He's our example. And if we will follow him in this, recognizing he reached out to us 
uh, man, I'm, I, I'm very much a sinner, but I'm a redeemed sinner because of Jesus, not because of me, because of him. And I'm trusting him to, to guide me. I'm trusting him to handle things. I'm trusting him to move things. And back to that sermon on patience on Labor Day weekend, one of the other fruit of the Spirit. I'm not very good at that part, but I'm learning and I'm leaning into it. And I know I'm under his authority. And as a sinner, redeemed by a God of grace and love, I think I can back up on being so on the edge. Uh, I don't like the uh, network news of cable news of just a bunch of people screaming at one another across a desk. Instead, uh, I'd pray that we could be a gentle people, a grace-filled people. Doesn't mean we don't care. Doesn't mean we don't engage. But we do it in a way that really reflects Christ instead of just another angry voice in the world. And the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. So, here's gentleness. And here's me. Here's you. How are those things measuring up? Let's lean into it.